We are back, and once again, Indianapolis still in our new studios, and uh, I've got Jeff Shiwi with me and Dano Steinhardt, Dan Steinhardt, and we're going to talk a little bit about photographic paper and a bunch of other fun things, the myths and legends and I shit you not stuff. And uh, What's the AMA stand for? And we have a list of AMA, Ask Me Anything, that's an acronym for you young folks that don't know what AMA stands for. And who's the myth and who's the legend? I'm the legend, the he's the myth. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Where does that place you? <laughs> One of the things that I always thought was fun to talk about is gicle, because everybody talks about gicle and what gicle is. There are a lot of different paper surfaces, and uh, Dan, Dan has spent some time going into what makes a paper and how paper is made, and uh, he's going to share a little bit of that with us right now. So, you know, one of the things people say, well, do you all go to the same plant and just change boxes and so forth. And that's not really true, is it? Well, the first thing is, uh, people often ask, does Epson make its own papers? And the answer is no, and that's by design. You know, with paper making uh, for inkjet, there's really three basic areas. It's the paper base manufacturing, the coating, and then the converting. And converting is not a religious thing, it's cutting it up. <laughs> but, <Amen. it's> a, <laughs> but it's a very important part of the, the whole process. We will go to different mills, uh, many of these are in Europe, some are in Asia. The legacy papers, particularly in Europe, will go to different coding facilities depending on what our needs are and what we need to spec for those papers. And then those papers uh, may actually be converted in different countries at different times. It's quite an interesting process, but it's uh, in many ways a very old world process with machines that were developed uh, 19th century. Uh, but with the latest technology and coatings. One of the things I was going to say when I was in school, art school, I actually went to art school. Um, uh, I had a, a teacher that we were doing drawing and, and watercolor painting. What you start with is a piece of art, which is basically a handmade fine paper. And what you add to it as a painter or drawing, um, he basically said, you start with a nice piece of art, don't screw it up. And that always kind of, I, I think about that too when I'm making prints, it's like the paper itself is a piece of art. And so I want to augment or add to it and um, basically embellish the actual art of the paper. Of course, Jeff and I went to competing art schools and we would start with great uh, paper and then make art. But I, I, I'll buy your... Uh, yeah, I mean, well, it, it is I art. went to art school and they used to say, well, because you're going to a crappy art school, we're using art rag paper. And then the whole thing about the rag mm. content and so forth is kind of a myth these days, isn't it? Well, many people insist on only using rag paper or I only 100 use 100% rag. 100 rag. Uh, that is a term uh, that is also uh, 19th century. Uh, people used to collect rags. There used to be, you know, uh, rag men, and you would give these rags. But certainly in the uh, last several hundred years, you would take these old discarded rags. It would go into a machine known as a rag beater in order to get all the properties, uh, the contaminants and other things. And it was literally, and before they had machines, I think it was people beating these things really? with rags. Right. The concept of paper making really hasn't changed, but actual rags have not been used in paper making that I'm aware of for inkjet for uh, decades. Some uh, last time I was checked in the museum was like 60 years. People use uh, for fine art cotton fiber. Cotton That's made fiber, from cotton right. linters. So some people would say, "Well, gee, I, I really I, I'd love to use Epson Media's papers." but you don't have 100% cotton rag paper. Today, that's essentially a marketing term. It's meant in the good faith, it's meant in the spirit of, uh, there's no, they're acid free, there's no lignin, there's no contaminants. It's not made from wood, which is called alpha cellulose, uh, but it's cotton fiber, not cotton rag. So now cotton fiber, it, it, it has um, kind of a thready feel to it. How we, I mean, how do we describe that it's, Papers normally are smooth, but the cotton rag has kind of a texture to it, like almost fibrous, for lack of better words. So how would you describe that? Uh, yeah, this is not my area of expertise, but there's uh, short fibers and there's long fibers. But again, you're using that rag term. 
<laughs> it's because, a, you know. it's a fiber. But these uh, raw materials of cotton, they're called linters, will go into a machine, some call that the pulper, and it's mixed with water. Water is a key component of paper making. Uh, fortunately today, uh, all the paper makers that we work with are very cognizant of water as a valuable resource. It's all uh, collected and make sure that anything that's returned to the rivers that a lot of these mills are on is all pure and, and can be drinkable. Uh, then that paper goes on to a device called, I may be mispronouncing this, Fondrinaire, which I always thought was a French thing, but as a British person, that was his name. <laughs> and it's essentially a wire that runs uh, a very long length and this pulp is put on this wire and the water is squeezed out of it. In old fashioned paper making, you would do this on a much smaller scale with a press and you would have to shake this to get the water out. And this Fondrinet machine, which is old, <laughs> there aren't a lot of new machines out there because the old ones work great, does the same thing. It can actually watch these things vibrate and shake and the water's being pressed out. So by the time it forms into sheets and then it gets rolled up at the end. But the way the texture, uh, there are some cold press papers, hot press papers. The hot press tends to be smoother, cold press. And then uh, you have the legacy texture paper, which, I mean, I like uh, photographic paper. So I tend to use exhibition fiber, Morida, or plat platine. How do you platine. pronounce that? Legacy platine. Platine. You do confuse it with the, the vegetable or fruit. And I think it's plantine? a fruit. Plantine? Yeah, it's like yeah. a banana. Yeah. yeah. He no. calls it plantine. Yeah. Let's, see, how, how do you, let's, let's platine. We'll settle it once and for all. Platine. Legacy platine. And here's platine. the other one we'll settle. It is burrita. 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 It is not burrita. It is burrita. Okay, everybody say that one time. Bar right up. <laughs> but the bottom line is the way in which the paper is made dictates what the surface is. The barita has a little bit rougher texture, for example, than the platine, right? Well, let's, let's uh, take some of the basics. Old fashioned handmade papers uh, had texture to them and people liked that texture. And that was known as a cold pressing, mm -hmm. not to be confused with making olive oil. <laughs> Maybe not dissimilar. <laughs> then people who wanted a smooth paper used heat, and that was called a hot pressing. Mm -hmm. So in the Epson media line, we'll talk about all the details later, there's cold press and hot press. Uh, it's to connote how the papers were made and what they mean to people. Today, a lot of the texture is put in during the paper making process with blankets. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, heavily textured papers will bring out these very large blankets that will go on the wire. So if you're in a paper making mill, so it's on the wire. It's not like an old fashioned uh, telegraph yeah, thing. It's actually the, the wire machine. got some machine. paper on the wire. And they'll put blankets on there to create these various textures. So, but the names are to help people understand the tradition of art paper and how those were made. Uh, but also in terms of the hot press and the cold press papers that Epson produces, you get uh, the hot press um, bright and the hot press natural. Or, um, hot. So the difference there is OBAs, optical brightening agents. And I've, I've heard that that is an evil thing. Uh, a um, confusing thing. Uh, sometimes misunderstood. Mis OBA mis stands for optical brightening agent. Uh, an optical brightening agent uh, will make the whites, the highlights, the paper base look brighter. Uh, the concept is the same with wedding dresses. So the wedding dress is very bright. Fluorescent. And they fluoresce, they get excited in the presence of UV. Optical brightening agents, over time, the myth is that, oh, my paper is going to yellow. The, the paper won't yellow, the optical brightening agent will stop fluorescing over time and go back to the natural paper base. But to be more precise or more accurate, which is what we want to do, the optical brightening agent, there are optical brightening agents that are okay, non-fluorescing OBAs. Barita arguably is a optical brightening agent. It is like titanium white. It is a non-fluorescing and therefore uh, longer lasting. Oh, you're 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 making that Dano face. Like <laughs> you don't really want to no, say yeah. what you want to say. Okay. No, it's just, this gets into a little bit of um, 
I wouldn't call it myths, but stuff that was out there, stuff that may have been true, but things have changed. changed. So if we think in terms of OBAs, inkjet printing has always been held to a higher standard. Oh my God, it's not this. Oh my God, it's not this. I think we're at a point now where most of that has dissipated. There's still a little bit out there. So many, this is in the, uh, let's say, late 1990s. I won't use uh, an inkjet print because it has an OBA. Mm -hmm. Then we point out that virtually all of Ansel Adams prints that sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars have OBAs. OBAs. And you can do this, uh, and we did this at John Sexton's place recently, and John used to print for Ansel Adams. You just take a uh, UV light, a little black light, and we put them on his prints from that era, and there were one or two Ansel Adams prints, and they just light up saying OBA. So they've been around for <clears throat> decades, and we've taken the position at Epson of understand what an OBA is and then make an informed decision if they're the right thing for you or not. Mm -hmm. uh, Barita is does not have an OBA. It is not a uh, really me, thought it? about as an OBA in and of itself. The, the history of Barita is that it was used as a subbing or a glue in order to adhere an emulsion onto a traditional photographic paper. And uh, in that process, they also realized, scientists and others at that time, before my time, Hey, this looks really good. <laughs> yeah. So it was a way to adhere the emulsion onto the paper. Yeah, oh, this is really here. nice. And it gave fiber-based darkroom prints mm -hmm. a certain look. Uh, barium sulfate. Barium sulfite? No, barium sulfate is barita. And that's that's why it's not barium sulfate. Barita comes from that. Uh, and it can, t in the spirit of an OBA, be an OBA, but it's not used as an optical brightening agent. As we moved into inkjet printing, uh, barita sulfate was starting to be used in different kinds of papers. Uh, and today, a uh, barita type paper, depending on the manufacturer, they'll either be using barium sulfate or something else to make it look like old-fashioned barium sulfate. Uh, but you can get a barita paper today with and without OBAs. The Barita that we have in the Legacy paper line, which is now called Legacy Barita 2, does not have an OBA because all our Legacy papers are OBA free. Because many people who buy that type of paper, uh, they are fine art photographers. Some are actually collectors specifying the type of paper. And for them, they want to have an OBA free print. So I asked you before whether LEDs were a good light source for viewing paper and you told me that you were going to tell me something that would shake my world. So tell me. Okay. The world is moving towards LEDs and that's a good thing yeah. for all the energy benefits and, uh, in home light. And I, and I can't wait until when we are back at trade shows, being able to touch a light and not, uh, Orange feel the need that I'm have to go to the emergency room. <laughs> <laughs> Big thing. But there's a, a little bit of a, a watch out, uh, that you should be cognizant of in that many, not all, but many LED lights, are spec'd in CRI, which stands for Color Rendering Index. Color Rendering Index was developed for fluorescent lights. Mm -hmm. uh, fluorescent lights uh, were notably not great when they first came out in, for photographic reasons, mainly in the, the cyans, the greens, the blues, and that part of the spectrum. They're actually very good for reds in that, that part of uh, the, the color world. Uh, so CRI only measures eight colors, and it doesn't measure any reds. It's really just measuring the, uh, the greens and the cyans. And I can show you uh, some meter readings to show you that. So LED lights are kind of the opposite uh, than fluorescence in that they're, they're very good in cyans, greens, blues. Inexpensive LEDs are very bad, can be very bad in reds and in flesh tones. But CRI doesn't measure those colors. So, it's a, so you can have a very high CRI spec LED uh, and have really poor print. Something's not right mm -hmm. if you're doing things with people. There's a, the standard that the motion picture industry has been using for a while and is now uh, very useful for LEDs. It's called TM30. Uh, TM30, which I forgot what it means. And there's actually a couple other TM30 dash something or other. Uh, you, there's... 
there's a big circle that, and you can see what's inside and outside of the full spectrum response. But what I like to use is an extended CRI, which is 15 readings that incorporates reds and browns and flesh tones. And good LED lights have a very high TM30 or very high extended CRI. Uh, bad LED lights, which tend to be relatively inexpensive, not dissimilar from what we did with the Solux versus something you would get at a you know a home store. Um, those could be very low on red. So you want to look at the TM30 number uh, to see what's really going on when if you're doing color critical work with LEDs. So I guess what I would have to say to that is I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> 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 but one of the things that I, I do think is important is if you're making prints, you should be aware of or cognizant of the proper viewing to evaluate a print. And one of the things that uh, Kevin just got, based upon my suggestion, is a GTI viewing box. It's useful to have a standard viewing environment to make sure that the image that you print and the image that you soft proof line up and match. And, and honestly, when I make prints, it doesn't surprise me when it comes out of the printer uh, because I've soft proofed and I know exactly what the image is gonna look like. But you have to have a standard viewing environment to make that determination. However, the standard viewing environment is not necessarily the environment that the print will live. So you really need to be able to look at it under tungsten, daylight, a daylight tungsten mix, or heaven forbid, nasty uh, office fluorescence. So the light under which the print is viewed has an impact on things like OBA and DMAX and contrast range. So I would say that's absolutely true at a more advanced professional level. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I can't <laughs> <help> myself. <laughs> but, but also I would say I, for decades, I've been saying, well, the standard was always 5,000K. Oh, no, it should be 6,500K. I mean, and I used to always say, gee, I don't live outside in daylight. It doesn't exist. You know, it's way too blue. I think if you're starting out in printing or you're new to printing, you don't have to get too crazy with standard references and proofing environments and Kelvin temperatures. And should it be D65 or should it be 6,500? Well, I think that one way to we need to sum that up is with all colors, whether however we see anything, especially on prints and magazines, we're dealing for at least with our minds and eyes, a subjective vision of this. Yes, we can be quantitative and measure the Dickens out of this as uh, you know, we have uh, Mark Siegel, who's part of the PXL uh, group that does all that mathematical stuff for those that need it. But essentially, I think you'll find that most of the time you pull a, a picture out of a printer, you can be in your basement with basement lighting or take it upstairs to the kitchen where you have, you know, tungsten and kitchen or daylight. That's going to look pretty good unless you really start getting down to it. It's part of the whole way we've been looking at pictures all our life. And uh, in the early days of inkjet printing, when we were on the road with the uh, Epson Print Academy, there were a lot of issues. <laughs> yeah. And it really you had to come up with professional ways to overcome those, to deal with stuff of uh, that really is almost in the history books now with metamerism, metameric yeah. failure, gloss differential, bronzing, all these kind of things, where you really needed to have this really tightly controlled environment uh, it's not quite as crazy. As no, it's, it's, it really isn't. And that's what part of the whole point of what we're doing here is to say, well, it's good that you know all this stuff, but it, really you don't need to worry a lot about it. And uh, for any of those people that want to know some of these words like metabolism and all the things that we can talk about, uh, it, with so, the actual article itself is a glossary of photographic terms that Dano has been collecting with the help of a lot of people over the years. And uh, we'll make that as a PDF that you can download and uh, look for it uh, underneath the video or in the art. Well, Jeff wants to give the quiz and then see if Oh, he, do you have a quiz? <laughs> no, he'll, he'll issue the quiz later. Oh, we'll yeah. See how so anyway, yes, you should study it. We can do it. We can do a quiz online if you'd like. <laughs> well, actually, it might be kind of fun. But there are, <laughs> yeah, I know that yeah. you'd relish in that. <laughs> so I hope you learned a, a little bit about at least how some papers were made and what the papers uh, are, are go through and uh, what OBA stands for and 
uh, Arborida and Platine and things like that. So um, hopefully this introduces some of it. We'll be coming back to another video where we're actually looking at paper surfaces and how they affect the, the image and some other things along that line. Uh, but I want to thank Dano for his expert advice and storytelling. Um, it does clear some things up in regards to it. And it's actually pretty fascinating watching how this paper, which we take for granted, you know, is made um, and, and is produced. And um, specifically to, you know, how lighting can affect the way we see our images. So, you know, that's something to consider when you're printing images. But for the most part, most people aren't going to experience a lot of those things. And, you know, you're going to make good prints and they're going to look pretty good to get started. And as you get further on in things and you want to be more quantitative, you can certainly do that. So, uh, Jeff and uh, Dana, thanks pretty much for hanging in there with this. And, uh, you know, we have a few more segments to go. Catch you soon. <laughs>